All right, everybody, here we are again. Um, let me pray for us as we get started, and then we'll dive right into the teaching. Um, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that you keep opening it to us and keep talking to us through it. Thank you for teaching us things that we could never figure out, never understand on our own. Um, please help us to be committed to following you and obeying you every day. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. So you get me for two weeks to study John 5, the first and second half of it, and it's just a gold mine. Jesus says really awesome and unexpected things in these passages, and there's so much here for us to learn. Um, I want to mention that I cut a lot of our passages in half just so that we'd have the time to digest them, but it was really difficult to figure out where to make the cutoff in this week and next week's passage in chapter 5. Um, Bible translations differ on where they end the paragraph, some after verse 29, some after verse 30, some after verse 31. So whatever, just know that it's a continuous speech from Jesus starting in verse 19 all the way through 47. This is such an interesting chapter. Um, the healing by the pool itself is interesting in many ways. Uh, normally, in passages where we see Jesus healing someone, they come to ask for his help. And Jesus says something about faith, and then he heals them. But in this story, unusually, we don't see the person Jesus heals exhibiting any faith or even asking for healing. The guy has no idea who he's talking to. It's just a man in the crowd. Jesus initiates the conversation with him with, hey, do you want to get well? And in response, the man just whines, nobody's here to push me into the magic pool. I can never be first. <laughs> and then, bam, Jesus says, get up and walk. Carry your mat and go home. And he's healed. So the healing is genuine. And I, I just imagine, in, in my imagination, like the man just like gets up and starts walking, carrying his thing, and he's like, what's going on? Where am I going? Oh, I guess I'm going home, okay? Um, and just like that, the man obeyed Jesus, and up he went. Um, he didn't even have time to be like, oh, you know, that's not really going to happen, so your speaking isn't going to do something. He just did it, because he, was, he had to obey Jesus. Um, and later, when he found out who healed him, what does he do? He reports back to Jesus' enemies. Questionable choice, right? Like, couldn't Jesus just heal people who would be loyal to him? Strange choice. Um, in verse 15, we see John refers to Jesus' enemies as the Jews. And I want to point out that in this chapter, we see two different ways that John uses the phrase the Jews. The first is in chapter 1, there was a feast of the Jews. So as controversial as saying 4th of July is an American holiday, no excitement is happening in that verse. Um, and then in, in our passage in verses 10 through 18, every time John uses the phrase, the Jews, he's referring directly to zoom in on the Jewish socio-political religious leadership members who are opposing Jesus. So when the Jews tell the guy who's carrying his bedroll headed home, no carrying your bedroll on the Sabbath. It's not like every Jewish person who was in town for the feast was like, whoa, 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 buddy, you better put that bedroll down. Um, it was really just these Pharisaic leaders. And they were super focused on following God's rules to a T. And how to honor God on the Sabbath was a big, big deal to them. And it's still a big, big deal to people who carry on their tradition. As I was studying this passage, I found this company called Kosher Innovations, and they have all these special products to help people feel like they are honoring God by how they keep the Sabbath holy, like this special toothbrush. Um, and to us living in freedom, it's laughable. Like, what do I care what kind of bristles are in my toothbrush, and do I need a special colored one for knowing which one is the Sabbath one? But this is real life for some people, and they need rabbis to discuss this and approve it. And if you look in the website, there's like pages and pages of rabbis approving each product that they're selling. And I don't think I've ever thought about the freedom to brush my teeth on a Sabbath before. <laughs> so Jesus told this guy to pick up his bedroll and walk, and the Pharisee Jewish leaders were not impressed by the healing of a man who had been disabled for 38 years. But they were upset that Jesus told this guy to violate their homemade Sabbath rules about not carrying stuff. And they sh tried to shut Jesus down over this. 
You saw in your homework that this was not the only time that Jesus butted heads with the Jewish religious leadership over healing on the Sabbath. It happened over and over and over. We saw a couple of his responses in the homework. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. In this week's passage, Jesus responds by giving his credentials, by showing his name tag, essentially. He goes straight to, um, I'm God, and I'm doing this by order of God the Father. To us in the year 2020, that doesn't sound shocking. It's kind of vanilla. We lose the impact on the original hearers because we're used to thinking of, oh, Jesus is God, and, and he's like the one that we pray to and stuff. Um, but in the moment Jesus said this, I'm sure that nobody expected him to go there. Most likely, even his closest disciples hadn't yet picked up on the fact that Jesus was God. Messiah, definitely. Prophetic powers, sure. Healings, absolutely. But God? Probably everybody gasped and said, he said, what? Well, way not to stir the pot, Jesus. Couldn't you have just said, you guys are being too uptight about your Sabbath rules. Have some compassion once in a while. Nope, just launch straight into Introduction to the Trinity, Divinity and Humanity of Christ 101. And so that's what we get to talk about is, is kind of the Trinity and what, what it means for Jesus to be God and man and, um, and all that. And then uh, a few weeks later, we're going to talk more about the Holy Spirit a lot as we get into the Upper Room Discourse. Um, Ironically, I think it was the very first time I taught at this Bible study, I said we should not try to explain the Trinity because we'll end up saying something heretical. Well, it turns out that somebody wrote a book exactly about my concern, and it's right here on Amazon for only fifteen fifty-five. Um, the Trinity, How Not to Be a Heretic. I didn't read it, and now I am having to explain what I see Jesus saying here. And what I can tell you is God is so big and beyond our understanding, even when he explains himself, we should be thinking about how great God is, the maker, the sustainer of everything. Job 26, 14 tells us that we've only heard a small whisper of everything that he's done. And it's good to find ourselves in awe when we think about the Trinity. It's good to stare at the stained glass and wonder at something that's way beyond our grasp. And it's fair to suspect that Jesus may be dumbing things down to a first grade level as he talks to us about the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. But there are really precious, amazing truths here about the God we worship. So if you go looking for it, the word Trinity or the phrases, the triune God, God in three persons, three in one, um, none of that appears in the Bible as such. These words are developed to sum up things that Jesus said developed by people who believed Jesus, who accepted him for salvation, and believed every word he said, and took the scriptures seriously. So the church throughout history has always taught that God is triune, the Trinity, three in one, because that's what Jesus said. It's just a basic Christian doctrine that you pretty much have to accept, because Jesus is a package deal. You can't pick and choose the truths that you like. Jesus doesn't come customizable. You can't say, I want purple with a racing stripe, or, or I need the convection setting. Nope. You either get the whole of Jesus, complete with things we don't totally understand, or you don't get Jesus at all. By the way, whenever Jesus starts a sentence with truly, truly, or if you're reading in the original language, it's amen, amen, he's giving a super solid truth that we need to accept. It's not about whether or not we understand it, but it's very true, so we better listen up. Now, there are those who wish to convince us that Jesus never claimed to be divine, that this was a label put on him by his followers when they banded together after his death. Um, some of these are, are atheists or people who would just want to discredit Christianity, and some of these people are within Christianity, some of those false prophets and false teachers that Pastor Willie was talking to us about from Second Peter 2 on Sunday. They'd like to boil all religion down to really mild and mellow statements like, there's a little bit of God in all of us, and make Jesus seem like some free love hippie. But if you want to believe that, you have to throw out a whole bunch of the Bible and pretend that you know what Jesus said while scrapping the eyewitness reports of what he said. Um, because if we listen to this passage, we see a very clear claim to divinity that people around him immediately understood to the point that they were ready to kill him for it in verse 18. 
They said, that's blasphemy. You can't say you're equal with God. But they heard him correctly. Jesus said, essentially, God the Father is always at work, so I, also God, also get to be always at work. And he claimed divine authority as God and the Son of God to dictate what is an appropriate Sabbath activity. And if we take the rest of the scriptures seriously, we see that the early church accepted and embraced Jesus Christ as being God after his resurrection. We would have read just a few weeks ago in John 1 through, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and without him nothing was made that has been made. We can flip to Colossians 1, 15 through 17 and hear Paul almost singing as he writes about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, visible and invisible, in the heavens and the earth, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Or listen to the writer of the Hebrews start out in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, through the prophets, in many portions, and many ways, in these last days has spoken to us through his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And he, the Son, is the radiance of his, the Father's, glory, the exact representation of his nature, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus, not just the Christ, but the maker and the sustainer of the universe. Everything is for him and he holds it all together. Jesus, truly divine, truly God. Everything in the Old Testament was true about God being one, and also God is Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As the passage continues, we get to hear Jesus give us more details. In the homework, I asked you to make a chart based on our passage about things the Father does and things the Son does. So here's mine, in case this is helpful. Um, so what big things do we see here? What big themes? Um, the first big theme I notice is that Jesus tells us in verse 19 that he is not initiating anything. He's doing what the Father directs him to do. Making the crippled man walk was something that the Father showed him to do. And later, the Father would show him other greater things to do, like raising dead people. We see God the Father giving the orders, showing God the Son how to participate in what he's doing because he loves him. And Jesus, God the Son, is living in submission to the will of God, his Father, because he loves him. Hey, that's not so strange. We have to do that too. I don't know about you, but when I see Jesus doing something that I have to do too, I get all warm and fuzzy, like finally something makes sense. Okay, I know about this part. I know about submitting and obeying and, and doing it out of love. Not that I'm good at it, but I know about it. Um, also, it seems like in some sense, Jesus is walking into a series of divine appointments that God the Father had prepared for him. We can actually see this happen pretty clearly in Luke 19, where Jesus goes to find despised tax collector Zacchaeus, my daughter calls him Zucchini, um, <laughs> and calls him down from the sycamore tree and tells him, I have to stay at your house today. Later that same chapter, he sends two disciples with very specific instructions about how to find a little donkey for him to ride on into Jerusalem. We see it in Luke 9:51, where we hear that Jesus is paying attention to the days are ticking by closer to the cross. So Jesus sets his face resolutely to walk toward Jerusalem. In John 11, we'll read that when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two days to wait for Lazarus to die before he went to go raise him from the dead. And of course, this is how we see last week's passage about the Samaritan woman at the well, total divine appointment. And again, if you've been walking with the Lord for a while, you know this sounds familiar because we also stumble into situations that we recognize as divine appointments, an unexpected conversation with a stranger in the checkout line, finding something on sale and the spirit whispers what we can do with it to bless somebody, or a simple kind word that produces a gush of tears in someone we didn't even know was struggling. Um, for some reason, mine are usually shopping related. I guess the Lord knows what I like. Maybe yours are dog related or Facebook related. I don't know. Yeah. And of course, Jesus is much better th at this than I am. More than half the time when the Spirit nudges me, I second guess. I say, that does not sound like a good idea. But Jesus sees his whole ministry, his whole earthly life even, as just following the plan God the Father has for him, step by step. 
In verses 19 through 20, we hear Jesus saying that he spends his time paying attention to what the Father is doing and looking for direction on how to participate in it. There were no chance encounters, no minutes wasted. Every healing, every conversation, every sermon was intentional as Jesus obeyed his Father. By the way, how did Jesus stay in touch with the Father and know his will and direction? Unlike me, he didn't have the YouVersion app on his smartphone, so he couldn't just flip and check in on the verse of the day. Um, but we know a couple of clues. First off, at his baptism, the Holy Spirit came down on Jesus, and so he had God the Holy Spirit with him. Um, another clue would be in Luke 6, 12 through 16, where Jesus spent all night in prayer. And then in the morning, he came down and chose out 12 of the many, many people who followed him and called them to be his apostles. Um, so it sounds like he was listening to God the Father through prayer. Of course, Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, so nothing works exactly the same as for us, but we also need to be in lots of prayer and be open to the Holy Spirit's direction. A second big thing to notice here is that the Father gives the Son authority, which doesn't take away from the Son being equal with the Father. And, and I hear myself hesitating, and as I start to get into technicalities, and I'm like, oh no, don't go there, don't go there, heresy, heresy, danger. Um, but we see in the passage Jesus is saying the Father gives him authority to raise the dead. The Father gives him authority to manage the final judgment, um, to give life to people. And verses 28 and 29 should bring us right back to the sheep and goats passage in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, where Jesus is the one who separates those who rise to life and those who rise to judgment. And if we accept what Jesus is saying that he's managing the final judgment, we can have total confidence about what he says in verses 24 and 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life, does not come into judgment, has passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, a time is coming and even now has arrived when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Confidence. Hear Jesus' words, Believe God, and you have eternal life right now. You are out of the judgment box. You have been removed out of death and into life. And in the next verse, Jesus says, the time is coming and has arrived, meaning now, when the dead hear and live. That's us, folks. Um, Ephesians 2, 4 through 10 talks about those who hear and live. Those who hear Jesus and the dead live. That's us. Praise God. Excuse me as I paraphrase the passage for you. You'll read it actually in the next week's homework. Um, we were dead in our sins, and God made us alive with Christ because he loved us so much. By grace, we are officially seated next to Jesus and destined to be a display of God's super rich grace. God's gift. Nothing we did. Even our saving faith was a gift. Nobody has bragging rights but the Lord. He did it, and he's showing off through each of us through the good things he's planned for us to do. He's showing off through you and me. So cool, hear him and live, praise God. But Jesus is exclusive too. According to verse 23, those who do not honor the son as equal with the father are not honoring the father who sent him. And this blows every theory about Jesus not claiming to be divine out of the water. And it makes it possible for people who want just a little bit of Jesus in their religion or spirituality. People who want to say, well, Jesus was a great teacher. He said some really inspiring things. Or I belong to a different religion, but I need to also find a way to include Jesus as a good person in my religion. No, he won't accept that. Jesus, just a good teacher or even just a great prophet, doesn't jive with what Jesus himself said. Our brother C.S. Lewis put it this way in his book, Mere Christianity. Um, it is small print, huh? I'll read it to you. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but not his claim to be God. That's the one thing we may not say. A man who's just a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, 
or you can spit on him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let's not come with any patronizing nonsense about being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He didn't intend to. Now, it seems to me obvious that he was not a lunatic and not a fiend. Consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. So there you have it. You can take it or leave it. But Jesus is either all he claimed to be, or you're not giving him the respect of taking his recorded words seriously. And for those who are willing to accept it, he's promised us a prize far greater than any losses we may accrue as we follow him. Let's thank him. Yeah. Lord, we thank you for time to study your word. Thank you for being so much greater than we can ever understand and yet revealing yourself to us. Help us to walk in that, to walk in the good works that you've prepared for us and be in prayer and listening to your Holy Spirit and studying your word to find your will for us every day. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen.